Okay. Um, before we start tonight, um, there is a request from Mr. DeShield to um, uh, amend the order of the agenda tonight and to take all of the um, finance-related items um, in order. So to move the work session on the goals and priorities to after the ordinance introductions. So moved. Is there a second? second? So it's been moved by Mr. Quinn, seconded by Ms. Howard. All in favor of amending the agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, so um, we will start with announcements, and I'll start on my right with Mr. Cohen. Any announcements this evening? Um, yes, I wanted to mention, um, reminded to think of it by Lance's in, uh, uh, announcement at our last meeting, there is a fundraising um, celebration for the Senior Resource Center on May 5th, Saturday, May 5th in the evening. So just wanted to make sure people have that um, in their minds. Yeah, just a reminder that the uh, Corner House has their, their event, since, since my, my fellow councilman brought that up. Their event will be at, on uh, April 13th at the Mercer Boathouse um, at the Mercer County Park. And you can purchase tickets through the Corner House. It's for the Corner House Foundation. It's a, a great, great fundraiser. Thank you. Ms. Grimmiller? Mr. Quinn? Uh, yes, one announcement, Mayor. Uh, the Civil Rights Commission is a co-sponsor along with half a dozen uh, community groups of a program titled The Problem with Punishment, Restorative Justice, and Equity in School Discipline uh, on Thursday, April 12 at 7 p.m. at John Witherspoon Middle School. Renowned national expert Dr. Ann Gregory will discuss the latest information about reform efforts in school discipline and highlight programming to prevent conflict and intervene constructively once conflict has occurred. So this is free and open to the public Thursday, April 12th at 7. Ms. Raga? Yes, uh, just one quick one. Uh, that weather permitting, uh, starting next week, uh, construction on the new Mary Moss playground is going to begin. We're all excited about that. Excellent. Um, so I have um, first an announcement or a request um, that I'm passing on to my colleagues about their announcements and reports from tonight. If everybody can please send those to Dolores or whoever the clerk is for the evening, because um, it makes it easier to get them into the minutes. Um, and then um, we have the chief here tonight and he's gonna be speaking a little bit with the annual report, a monthly report, but I just wanted to say thank you. Um, this has been um, uh, just unbelievable um, week for the police and it's just a time where I'm just so thankful for the department that we have. You know, first there was the storm um, and then there was the awful incident at Panera and there was yesterday's, Saturday's rally. Um, and it was, you know, we couldn't ask for more professionalism and I think the training that has gone in over the years really shows on events like this um, and the relationships you've built within the community and with your partners um, to make those events go as, um, especially with the storm, go smoothly and um, we're just really thankful, so. Um, all right, um, so now we'll move on to, oh, are there any staff announcements? Yep, okay, and um, then we'll move on to comments from the public for items that are not already on the agenda. Would anybody like to speak on something that's not already on the agenda? Okay, I'll close public comment for this evening and we'll move on to reports and um, we'll start with the chief. Thank you, Mayor. I, uh, I did want to make um, a statement about the incident that occurred last week at, at Panera, and I don't normally like um, reading prepared remarks, but I think Can you just make sure you're in your mic? Sorry. Yep. I think it's important that um, I be very deliberate and clear, given the sensitivity of everything surrounding this. So I just wanted to share some thoughts from a statement that I prepared for tonight, and then I could take some questions to the extent that I can answer them. 
So I wanted to make a statement about the tragic events of last Tuesday, March 20th. I feel very strongly about communicating facts to the public and always maintaining the transparency that is so important for our community to have faith in. Due to the ongoing investigation by the Attorney General's office, I am prohibited from speaking about specific facts, but I feel compelled to share some thoughts with everyone. You have often heard me say that we prepare and train with the notion that it is a matter of when, not if, we will be faced with a tragic incident like we were last Tuesday. While it is unfortunate to have to take such a mindset, in our line of work it is a necessity. However, when faced with these situations, one quickly realizes that you can never be fully prepared for the trauma that these incidents afflict on so many. As police officers, we hold the sanctity and preservation of life as our number one mission. We pledge that we will give our lives to save the lives of others. I can tell you that I saw this principle play out time and time again last Tuesday. I can also tell you that we never want an incident to end with the loss of life. We do everything in our power to prevent it. When a life is hurt, or when a life is lost, we hurt as much as anybody. I am confident that we did everything possible to help the person involved in this incident. Some of our officers placed themselves directly in harm's way to talk and comfort him throughout his crisis. I also know that the process of healing will take time for members of our community and our police department. They should all know that we are here to support them through that process. I mentioned our preparations for incidents like this. We train, we create policy, and we train some more so that we can effectively operate through critical situations. We just don't know until faced with a critical situation how effective these preparations are. I saw these preparations at work last week, and I could not be more proud of the way our officers performed. They were professional, courageous, selfless, but most of all, they were compassionate. Every move and decision that was made was done in order to save lives and protect the public. They did absolutely everything that we expect from them and much more. I also want to mention the support of all the agencies that assisted us, including the New Jersey State Police, FBI, Mercer County Sheriff's and Prosecutor's Offices, and our neighboring departments, including the Princeton University Department of Public Safety. With all the areas of operations that are required in incidents like this, and the fact that police services are required in other areas of the community, we can get overwhelmed quickly. Our communication was excellent, and our colleagues were there to assist us very quickly and throughout the entire incident. I also want to thank members of the community, municipality, and the governing body for the support you have given to all those affected. Your support will be vital as the healing process continues. I am confident in the process regarding the investigation of this incident. I know it will be thorough. I know it will be independent, and I know it will provide the facts that our community deserves and the facts that we want them to have. We will also conduct a thorough internal review of this incident when the time is right. We will produce a timeline and go through every action, decision, and policy that was deployed. While I'm confident that our processes work well, we will improve and we will get better. Thank you, Chief. I, I'm, I'm really glad that the timing worked out that you're here tonight so soon after because I think a lot of us, I'm sure everybody in this room, everybody in the community has been talking about last Tuesday and of course many of us were downtown on Saturday for the rally and so I think we were all struck by the juxtaposition of the, the rally for uh, preventing gun violence and, and then what had just happened in town. And I want to start, first of all, by saying that the officers were fabulous. They were so accommodating. I was in sort of the spillover crowd that we kept pushing to the edges, and they were so accommodating of all the rally. So, I, you know, thank, please thank folks. They allowed the crowd to really spill over and take over the streets. Um, but I think there was a lot of concern from the community. Geez, here we are talking about gun violence, and something's just happened in our community, of course. Um, so many of us felt it, and so I, if I can, I, maybe I'll ask you some questions, and if you can't answer them, you can't answer them. But first of all, on the, on the investigation, the AG's investigation, do you have a sense of timing? I, I know um, these investigations have been known to take months. Right. I, um, so I can answer this in two ways. So I've talked about the processes that, that have been developed in New Jersey where 
the agencies that are involved in the incident are walled off, meaning it's completely independent. There's no exchange of information other than the official uh, investigatory process, and that's a great thing because that should give everybody 1,000% um, faith that the investigation is independent done by the Attorney General's office. On the other hand, from my perspective, um, it's frustrating because we don't get any information to give to the public. So to answer your question directly, um, from my experience with these types of things and um, talking to other people that have experience with these types of things, I would expect it to be at least a month to more. Um, I think the facts uh, from my investigative experience are there. Um, there's not a whole lot um, to do other than put everything together. You know, there's there's a lot of things. It it, it uh, it's a super serious type of investigation with a lot of at stake. With a lot at stake, not the least of which is public confidence, um, and then you know officers involved in their livelihoods and things like that, not to mention the family of the person that was lost. All these people are stakeholders. They're all involved um, in, this, in this incident, and I think all, their, you know, all those things are taken into consideration. So that's helpful, I mean, just in terms of setting expectations that we shouldn't expect to be hearing next week, that it may be a while, and that's not an indication of any problems. That's just the process working, and you're not going to be able to say more about it because by because our officers were, were at the scene, you're walled off by necessity, and that's how it should work, and we want it to work, right? But, I mean, let me just ask, how long did, it, did the standoff last? Yeah, so I, I think the, the um, it, it's hard because... I and mean, when I, did it start? I mean, it was at least five hours, or...? It was from 10.26 to just after 3 p.m. And in that time, I can tell you um, wholeheartedly that we were involved in life-saving efforts the entire time. Well, that was um, what I was going to ask, too, is in terms of your training, when you're trained for situations like this, what is the ultimate goal of the training? What is your you focus? Know, it... it um, it's interesting because, and again, I, I, I cringe to talk about these things because of the seriousness of them, but it's what we prepare for. And we often prepare for active shooter situations where we are responding to people that are actively um, engaging the public with a firearm or a weapon. And we certainly were responding to that. Uh, that that likelihood and it quickly transpired into a um, Situation where that was still a possibility and we were dealing with a, a person in crisis and Somehow all those things have to come together um, With the number one concern being the public safety Absolutely paramount that we limit exposure and that we limit um, the possibility of a bystander getting hurt or members of the public. And right next to that is the welfare of the subject. Those are the two primary concerns. Um, and I can tell you that this is the absolute nightmare type of scenario for any police officer to have to, to see it end like this. So, and, so hypothetically, in, in situations like this, when is lethal force used? Um, it, it's very clear that uh, lethal force, uh, use of any force, but specifically deadly force, has to be used when deadly force is imminent against a police officer or another person. So that means that the officer has to believe that he or she or an innocent bystander is going to be subjected right then and there to the use of deadly force. And that's when um, lethal force is justified. So is there anything, I mean, I think we've all said this by email, but is there you know, anything we can do to support the force and how they're recovering from this? I think um, everybody's support from from everybody here and the public and um, I think, you know, I think part of the frustration, I, having gone through these things before in my career, you, you want, you really want, as the people involved and as the chief, you want everybody to know the facts. 
you want everybody to have all the information because kind of the, the speculation is over and everybody can make up their mind about what occurred. And I think that's part of the maybe frustration. So that'll, when, when that happens, that'll right. alleviate some stress. But I also think that um, we have really been super proactive about um, acknowledging the need to heal and dealing with emotions and things like that. So I think everything that can be done is being done. And I know they know you're here to support them and I'm here to support them. And uh, you know, it's, you, you train, you do all these things, but I have to tell you when, you, when human life is in front of you and lost, it, it doesn't go away easy. And um, it's not something that'll go away really soon for, for them. Well, this is helpful to hear. I mean, I think we all knew how seriously you took this, but it's, it is, um, I'm glad you've been here tonight to talk about that. I, I have a question about the annual report, but I don't want to, but I'm there maybe one of. No, I, I mean, I don't want to repeat what everyone said, but I, I couldn't thank you enough thank you. and the force. Um, and I'm asking a question that, that has been asked of yeah. me, and so I'm asking you. That's good, yeah. Do the um, state police have body-worn cameras? Do you know? They do wear body-worn worn cameras. Um, yes, they do. They wear them. Yeah. I'll be on the mic now. I just want to ask a clarifying question. So it was reported in one of the newspapers that the, um, the reason why the Attorney General's office is conducting the investigation um, is because um, uh, whenever the officer who fired is a county, state, or federal officer, that is when, and not a municipal officer, that is when the AG's office come, comes in. And can you just confirm that that's Yes, so that's, um, and that you can, everybody can research that. The, um, the process that was put in place that I've talked about before on uh, the change in the shooting response is the protocols as follows. When there's a um, incident involving municipal law enforcement, the county prosecutor investigates. The attorney general basically sits above, for lack of a better word, the, the chief law enforcement officer in the state is attorney general, so they sit over everybody. but. We always go through the prosecutor to the attorney general's office. So if they would investigate our shooting, the attorney general's office investigates county and state shootings, and that's uh, law enforcement shootings, and that's in the policy. There are exceptions to that rule at times, but that is the overwhelming procedure. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for the chief on the Panera incident? Yeah, Ms. Fraga? Actually, something came to mind, and I don't know if, if you would be the one to answer it or, or another department, but I understand that counseling was made available anytime that someone's involved in this type of situation. And I was wondering if that would also apply to the employees that were at Panera or... Great, great question. So um, I have to tell, if you'd allow me to elaborate just for a minute to tell you how proactive that we are is that that becomes a almost part of the immediate response is trauma counseling so we mandate it to make it easier police officers aren't always welcome to admit vulnerabilities and it's just sometimes the culture i'm glad to say that we break that stereotype and we've preached this from day one that we were here to help and we mandate it for them so they don't have to make the decision. So to answer that question, we mandate it for our officers. That night, I spoke to Panera um, corporate in person. They were already providing that um, service for their employees. So that was being done within almost moments of the culmination of this incident. So it's so important, um, and our counseling services are really top-notch I have full faith in them thank you yeah. um, now I just I heard I don't know if it's true or not but when incidents like these happen happens within Panera's they end up redoing the entire store is that true I, I so I, yes yeah I, that for my from what I'm told yes um, and I say that to say that this will be a month and month 
closed location. Am I? I think uh, from what my last conversation was, we've been there to support them the entire way, and I, I, I was led to believe the reopening was imminent. Okay. Um, right. I know there's some inspections and things that have to be done by like the health department, and uh, uh, Mr. Grosser and I were actually communicating with them as recently as Saturday, so I, I think it's imminent. Okay. Right. Moving Good. chief is correct in terms of um, we have done the health inspection there. There you go. I um, mean, it's just a matter of them deciding when they will open. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hey, just a, a chief, uh, first of all, thank you. And please extend our thanks as I wrote to you the day afterward. Um, uh, council's thanks for the professionalism and any resources that we can offer to the force, it would certainly. I wondered if you would comment on, um, and it's okay not to, uh, about the media coverage as, as the incident was developing. It's obviously not something that you were, that you were monitoring in real time. I, I think we've all come to learn, uh, we've all learned through following these active shooter incidents that a lot of what's initially reported turns out to be not true and that people are acting off of bad information. So in this case, having, I'm sure that you've reviewed some of the media accounts, if not in real time, then later, was, could you just comment on what was released and what your understanding was of sure. how it was reported? Absolutely. So I've been able to catch up since. I've been trying to catch up on everything, and it's hard doing it backwards. Um, so we were trying to get out information immediately about public safety. Stay away. This is what's going on, and I think that was effective. We were. I think that message was really getting out to people. There's something going on that you don't want to be here. That was great. Um, I guess with the coverage, I'll. I will add in that social media, I guess, is a, another big issue with that. And there was a lot of false information that, in my research going backwards, that was reported. Um, and some of it was based on witness accounts. So maybe it's what somebody did think they saw, which is another issue. I, I do have to tell you, so to your question, I think it was really effective at the beginning to the extent that people knew what was going on to the extent that we could tell them and that public safety reasons stay away from the area. Facts that were being put out, um, I guess even nationally, were, were, I would say they were wrong, but I think through my reading, they were getting information from people that either said they were witnesses or were witnesses that were getting it, the information wrong. They thought they saw something that they didn't see. Now, I can tell you, um, being in an in a operation center, feet from where the incident was occurring, there's a time lapse from what's occurring and what even I'm getting. So there's a, if, I guess to make some commentary, you know, there's a race to put out information. And I think um, even with witness accounts at a scene, we have to be careful because witnesses are going through trauma as well. And it affects, and I, in my research that I've done on the incident, that was part of the biggest problem was some specific facts that were said of occurrences that were, had taken place that hadn't. And um, really there would be only one way to, to have that information and that would be to have been inside and been there to, to see what's going on and um, that, I, that's one of my frustrations with investigations, is that I want to put it all out so that everybody, everybody deserves to have that information. And it's really a frustrating part um, because these things happen. And it's, it's like the old telephone game too. People talk and say somebody told me and then it goes on social media and then it gets reported. And I don't know, we can't get in front of, we try so hard to get in front of social media and it's literally going out before sometimes we're getting information. It's part of the issue. Thank you, Chief. Okay, oh, Ms. Howard. 
So, well, I think we, we should remark on the annual report, which is this. Did, did you want to comment did, on it before? I, we... I had a few takeaways. Do you yeah. want me to start yeah. the conversation? I just did some highlights. Um, it's a it's a voluminous report to some extent. Um, I do want to comment that uh, there was one um, error in data, uh, page 41, with non-criminal incidents. There were some monthly stats transposed with yearly stats. I'm going to have that corrected. But um, the first thing I wanted to, the first takeaway I, I thought I would point out is the, the demographics of the police department. We are so proud about our recruiting and the, uh, especially to the extent that we have recruited since two thir 2013 some very, very qualified uh, ladies and men. And we've really been able to diversify the police department. Um, it's been a, it's a, it's a, it's a pillar of our recruitment policy. We do um, a lot of outreach. We are not even in a, I thought I would point this out. This is pretty neat. We haven't started a full recruitment yet. We've kind of put feelers out to say, hey, we're gonna, we have to start recruiting. We use a, um, a, a, a site that helps us gather people. It's free and people can sign up. We have 3,000 interests and nothing's been announced. So that's pretty, that's pretty neat, and I'd like to hope it's part of our um, outreach that we do with recruitment, and that we're we're also very we're we're present uh, on the web. I think which helps, and and just something I wanted to point out about about the demographics of the department. Um, secondly, the community survey. A uh, couple takeaways: 2013, we did a community survey and we received zero responses from the Hispanic community, zero. This time we received 59. Now, I wish it was, you know, 1,059, but you can see that even though we literally went out for months to uh, events with tablets, recruiting people to do, uh, get active in the survey, it's just, um, it's difficult. So we received uh, some 200 responses to almost 300 I believe um, and I didn't write that down but it's somewhere in that area and you know there's some specifics you may want to ask me about uh, later but the overwhelming um, responses were positive and not surprising to anyone the largest concerns are traffic pedestrian um, speeding and bicycle concerns are the number one concerns of our of our uh, community um, I wanted to point can, out. Yes. Can, can you um, flesh that out a little bit? Because yeah. there are all kinds of concerns people can have about pedestrians, pro and con, yeah. bicycles, same yeah. thing. Yeah, I think the um, the responses indicate that safety, safety concerns regarding and enforcement concerns regarding pedestrians uh, in, with motor vehicle traffic, motor vehicle laws, and the safety of bicyclists remain important they want to i think our community wants us to see us active in all aspects not just enforcement but i get a lot of feedback as well about education bicycle safety you know motor vehicle safety and things so we're we're on it and we're going to respond to it but it, it i think the report validates what we hear all the time and in, in, in the report in the um survey that was definitely a concern uh, not to get too far in the weeds, I just want to, I wanted to point out the data on our risk assessment committee. You hear me speak about that all the time. It's how we compare patterns within the department of uh, race, ethnicity, and gender, specifically with high uh, profile things like arrest, marijuana arrests, all things that have been identified by the Attorney General's office uh, to indicate, uh, Attorney General, and excuse me, the ACLU, that indicate um, patterns of profiling. So we've developed a, um, a, a spreadsheet of sorts, but a formula, an algorithm that we use that compares all of these things and points out patterns to us statistically that we can delve into. And if anything stands out, we can look at it and see why something happened. We do that quarterly. And I included those statistics in here. We're very proactive with that. Um, I wanted to point out one last thing to you. I kind of think this is a really neat statistic and I don't think the public knows. I'll, I'll, they probably think it's the exact opposite. I put a uh, 
a chart in the report about warnings, motor vehicle warnings versus motor vehicle summonses. So if per stop, um, how many warnings are issued in the aggregate and how many summonses are issued? What you see is that 70% of motor vehicle stops are warnings where people don't get a summons. They get warned. And I, I speak a lot about the, not the importance about getting a summons, but about the educational aspect and awareness of, of the officer having a contact. A warning can be effect, as effective as a summons. And I think the public, um, it's an interesting statistic. So, you know, we're not driving revenue. We're not heavy handed in terms of enforcement when we're, we're there to raise awareness and education. And that's really what it's about. And that's what I have. Terrific. So, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, I guess I want to return to that because that was one of the one of the pie charts that I was focusing on was the um, lower, you know, not negative feelings about enforcement, but the lower approval ratings for enforcement, right. and um, it relates to my earlier question. But I know I talk to people who wish the police were giving more tickets. Mm -hmm. Some people wish they were giving more tickets, summonses to motorists. Mm -hmm. Some people wish they were giving more summonses to bicyclists. Some wish they were giving more summonses to pedestrians. I haven't heard anyone say, I wish they would give less summonses. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'm um, curious, you know, whether you feel like the the department is giving enough summonses or in too many or too many warnings. I, I do. I, I think um, so. To answer your question, I think the stats, uh, the statistic is in there. We gave nearly nine thousand summonses last year. It's a lot of summonses, but it's still only thirty percent of the total stops. And what we've preached and what what the um, best practices show, and especially in the twenty first century policing report is that it's not, um, a lot of communities have gotten really um, stuck in a, in a bad system of um, heavy handedness and summonses as a, as a um, for a lot of reasons. But we have preached from the beginning, and I think this is where maybe education helps, or at least a discussion in the community. We feel it's, we, I could stop you and issue you a summons, have a, very limited contact with you and send you on, on your way and all you know is that you got a ticket and you're really upset about it and you have to pay a fine and the whole lesson of what you did to cause that just goes right out the window. We believe in having conversations, explaining to people. Um, a lot of people, I have to be honest with you, a lot of people from other parts of the state and country don't know about the big pedestrian crossing problem we have and they don't even know what crosswalks are and what the law is. and. We have that converse. People will say all the time, why are you stopping me? I wasn't speeding. Well, you know, sir, ma'am, you almost hit that pedestrian in the cross. What crosswalk? And then we have a conversation. Oh, I didn't know I had to stop. So to me, that's as effective, and we do preach that, um, that that's as effective, if not more effective, than the, the, the summons. It's more about the, um, the contact and we want to try to make these contacts as positive as we can. And it's not that we don't give summonses. There are times that summonses are needed. But if everything's a summons, I can tell you from experience, the interaction between the police, from my perspective, and the community, it, it detrimental. Yeah, yeah, I want to follow up because um, uh, you know, we're, I don't know if you're going to stay for the discussion when we're passing our traffic calming resolution. Sure. I don't, I mean, because you don't, ha I mean, we could talk about it. No, literally, were you going to stay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. sure. <laughs> I mean, because I feel bad that, making no, it. No, no, he's no, going to stay. No, I know. I mean, I, I know. I mean, I think, it's I mean, fun. it didn't occur to me that because we are considering asking the police force to step up enforcement. That's mm -hmm. in part of the um, traffic calming mm -hmm. resolution. You know, we hear. What I hear from people is, oh, I go somewhere else and I get a speeding ticket, and people know to go slow, and it it it, it seems like we could be more aggressive. But I, you know, on the other hand, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, another thing that I hear is that, and I can relate to this, and that's that police officers don't like giving tickets. 
I mean, it must be the worst part, of, one of the worst parts of the job, because everybody's mad at you, and they cry. I know I cry sometimes. <laughs> I just can't help it. It's like my dad's yelling at me. <laughs> but, um, you know, so it must be really horrible to give out tickets. Yeah, I, I think I, and it's a great discussion to have, and it's super interesting to me, actually, because of the different dynamics involved and the different people I speak to with differing opinions. And I guess the, the way we look at it, the new way we're looking at it, is that enforcement doesn't necessarily mean arrest or summons. We were driven as a industry by summonses and arrests for a very, very long time. And it got us in a very bad place several years ago. And we're trying to get out of it. Um, that's part of the issue. When I mean we, I don't mean Princeton necessarily, I mean us as police officers. And we're trying to put a new face on enforcement, I think, as an industry that it doesn't necessarily mean summons. But I always say this, and I'll be brief, when you drive by a car being stopped on the side of the road, the kids will always say in the back seat, oh, he's getting a ticket. Everybody thinks the person's getting a ticket, right? Getting pulled over, they're getting a ticket. So to everybody driving by, oh, the police are out here, they're issuing speeding tickets, I better slow down. So you can argue it's the same effect. I, I hear, believe well, me, I, we've, been draw, we've driven summonses for, for years, and this is an out-of-the-box type of, of thinking, or uh, really since the 21st century police report came out is what dr drove it. And I think it's a great discussion to have in, about the, the future of the department and what we see as enforcement. Is there a way to apply data to this somehow? Because I know the speed signs do collect it, and maybe yeah. there's something where we could do a little experiment where you're more, a higher percentage of so people will actually get a ticket yeah. and then others wouldn't, and maybe you the, compare. I don't know. I mean, it could be like a little study. We, we have to be careful of with that is that um, I can't, as a chief or as a supervisor order somebody to issue a summons because of, of quota. There's laws against quotas. So we can't say to somebody, you have to go out there to that road and issue all summonses. It's very discretionary. So what we try to do is train and develop a culture of when maybe summonses are more appropriate than a, than a warning. And there are reasons for that that we train on. Um, and training's everything. So maybe if you know, we decide that to be more effective as a police department, we need to go in another direction. We train that. Well, I, I don't think um, necessarily um, giving more summonses is the answer, but just having having people drive through town and think, uh-oh, right. somebody's watching me. I mean, I think there are some towns that are really aggressive, and I think we want the, our town to be like that. But I hear what you're saying. Yes. It's not like I want to nail people and balancing act. Well, and I think, let me jump in. You're, the, you've referenced a couple of times the 21st century report. This is as a reminder that was President Obama commissioned uh, a commission to look at policing in the 21st century after um, the events in Ferguson to really rethink the role. And you cite it often, Chief. And I was struck by something, and maybe it's related to this also in the report, that the number of warrant arrests basically dropped in half from 2016 to 2017. It went from 142 to 74. And those are when somebody is stopped for mm -hmm. a minor violation, but because of a warrant is handcuffed and taken downtown. That's exactly the kind of stuff we talked about not liking. And my, I, am I, if I'm reading this right, this shift in tactics, more people are being stopped for motor vehicle issues, but because fewer summonses are being given, that's leading to fewer arrests, which is exactly the sort of, um, disparity that we've been trying to avoid in our policing, right? So it's, I mean, this is all about finding a balance, but it seems like you've tipped it in the right way by doing this. More stops, I mean, we told you, I think, Jenny, right? We said we want more enforcement, more stops, but by having fewer summonses has actually been fairer. Does, am I reading that right? Is that why there well, would be I half think, as many? I think it's a, ma it's a, it's a really good question, and it's a, it's a, we can't correlate the summonses that we issue. I mean, I guess you could to a point to warrants. Um, it's a shift in where we've become, uh, I'm trying to explain this correctly. We've become very, with motor vehicle enforcement, complaint responsive. So historically, we have a shift briefing and everybody goes on the road to their sector and does 
patrol and will sit on a road and do some type of proactive enforcement or go walk foot. We've been very directed with our enforcement. So we say there's a complaint on Olden Lane for speeding. You go to Olden Lane and enforce speeding. There aren't huge amounts of warrant arrests on Olden Lane. You go to pick a street where there's a pedestrian issue. There aren't high amounts of warrant arrests on said street. However, we got a complaint about speeding on 206. Heavier traffic volume, a lot of out of town, out of state volume, warrant arrest spike. So I think it's a matter of a directed patrol and the way that we now direct enforcement to complaints rather than just saying our officers will naturally be drawn to areas of high volume. Downtown, 206, with directed patrols by supervisors, we force people to go to streets that may not have gotten the coverage, if you will, or responses in the past. So we're very directed with that. And I, th I want to attribute it to that, though I don't have, I can't really. Well, maybe public safety can continue to talk about that. Yeah. Two, two more quick things, just for my colleagues. Big increase in the number of accidents involving deer. So just keep that in mind as we yes. talk about the deer hunt. And we knew that we had a bad year last year, so it's not surprising that there was a significant increase, almost a doubling of accidents with deer. So just put a pin on that. We should F give tickets to the deer. I'm sorry? We should give tickets to the deer, yes. Um, and then I just uh, the the report itself looks great. I don't know whether you got Thanks. our res re resident millennial Tim Quinn on it or something, but it, um, to use Jenny's terminology. I'm actually uh, going to take credit for the graphics myself. It's very impressive. One, so. <laughs> But I also just think it looks great and it really humanizes the department. A lot more pictures of the, of the yeah. officers, which is great. And I'm just, I'll just leave it with this, struck by on the survey that 90%, 95% of the people surveyed agreed or strongly agreed. So agreed That's good. that the police department treats people fairly and with respect. That's pretty amazing. That's, That's what important. we're constantly talking about. That's pretty amazing. So congrats. Important. Yeah. Ms. Lerman. Yeah, uh, Chief, thank you so much. Um, sure. You know, for, for the, the police department, I. I want to repeat what everyone up here has said in all of our emails to you in re regard to this. Uh, the guys do a terrific job. Um, I noticed from 2017 to 2018 um, harassment. I don't know why it's spiked. Do you know? Yeah, there's nothing changed in the reporting. Usually it's a reporting issue. It's not that. I would, wouldn't look at it as a trend. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, uh, a thing that happens. Um, harassment, just so you know, by definition, is anything from uh, verbally harassing or intimidating to a, um, a pushing and shoving short of uh, assault. Mm -hmm. we, I, I will say we find it a lot in domestic violence. You know, we find harassment um, encounters a lot in domestic violence. Most of them are related to either domestic violence or juvenile, um. juvenile type issues that are maybe not as serious. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I, I heard the answer. I'm here. <laughs> thank you. Did you have a question for the Chief David? Well, I, I did want to go back to what Heather was saying and just clarify. I'm not sure if I misunderstood your question about the decrease in the warrant arrests, but I know from going on my ride along with uh, Officer Craven, which was a great experience, and by the way, available to anybody yes. in the community. Um, I think even if he just issues a warning, he has to check the database, and if there's a warrant out, he has to do the warrant arrest. So there's not a distinction, you know. I think it's more to that, yes. Yep, yep, Ms. Cromwell. I should have um, asked you this ahead of time, but um, you know, I noticed that we had 54 gun permits, and I'm always wondering how many guns are in our community. How many people are walking around that I don't know have a gun in their pocket? And could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, so I mean, is that more? Is 54 the normal amount? Has it gone down? Is it always about that many? It's usually within. It's it's very 
strange how these numbers fall with almost in one digit of each other from year to year. A lot of these different numbers, it's strange how that happens. But um, just to be clear, a permit doesn't mean they can carry the weapon. A okay. permit is just guns that are purchased. And is that like a, a rifle or is it just a handgun? Good, good question. So a permit is a handgun. In the state of New Jersey, if you apply for a firearms identification card, it's a background process that takes place. Once you have that card, you don't have to go back to the police department to buy what's considered a long gun, a, a rifle, um, a, a gun other than a handgun. A uh, handgun requires a, a second step, which is a permit. Um, I will say our permitting, we, we go by state guidelines. Um, we do thorough um, investigations that are, go through a four-step process in our PD. They go from a detective to the detective sergeant to the detective lieutenant to me. So there's, you know, four sets of people that read and reread the process. It's all done by state guidelines, and it's very important um, for lots of reasons that we follow those guidelines to the T, um, and we do. So 54, yeah, that's about, that means there were 54 permits issued to buy a handgun. And not all buy handguns. Not all of them that get permits, do they all buy handguns? Firearms permits are just for handguns, yes. But, handguns. but what about but, assault rifles? Well, they, uh, anyone with a firearms identification card doesn't have to come back to us. So once that card's issued anywhere in New Jersey, they could move to Princeton and just take that card and go and buy a... a Any gun? Buy a, rif a rifle. A rifle. But they have to go, to, they have to go they? through okay. another check at the firearms dealer when it's done commercially. Um, uh, an NCIC check that basically checks criminal background, but it doesn't come back through us. It only comes back, it has to go through us every time for a handgun. And then they're not, people aren't allowed to conceal it here, right? That's, or, a, that's the... a separate application. I've gotten, in the last five years, I've gotten two. They get referred, I look at it first and deny or approve. Um, quite frankly, I, I deny both. Wow. Then they go, to, they go to the superior court, and the superior court either affirms the chief or chief uh, law enforcement officer in the town's decision or overrides it. It's, very, it's a very strict process for, to carry a firearm. Chief, I, first of all, I was struck by the amount of professional development that our officers do. The list is long and impressive. And I wonder if you could, for the benefit of, of those who haven't read the report, talk about the CLEAR training, which yes. is the Community Law Enforcement Affirmative Relations so training. I, th I want to say that it's great that the state did this. We've been doing it, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we have been for, uh, for years. Um, and basically, these classes are now mandated by the state, which is great. And it includes de-escalation training, uh, community policing, um, diversity um, and um, cultural competency training, um, sensitivity, things like that, that we um, have been doing, uh, anti-profiling. Uh, so we're getting it, so in our department, we're kind of getting it twice now. We still do our training and we do the clear training because you can't train enough so we work it into our um, curriculum, and it's great that it's mandated. I think, I think mandating things just makes it part of your culture, doesn't leave it up to discretion, and it kind of makes sure that we're all doing it the same way. But I also feel that we need to be above the baseline. So we'll go, it's great, we'll go above that. And you'll see that in that training. We do other training to, um, that goes beyond. I also want to thank you for putting together this report and, and the pictures and the are graphics. The yeah. pictures are great. I have to say it just they, you know, it's like a thousand words and some of them are really great. It made me hungry for like a chocolate chip birthday cookie cake. Yeah. Um, and also doing the survey again after five years was really informative. And I just want to congratulate you thank too you. on the outcomes of that. I think it shows 
the strides that the department has made and it's really exciting to see that. Um, I had one nitpicky thing that yeah. I had mentioned to you before. Yes. So we were both attended um, a meeting last week, I think, on this concept of Vision Zero, which is, um, it's, a, it's a framework it's sort of parallel to complete streets, but it's essentially a framework for looking at your engineering projects and with the goal of saying, um, if we design our roads correctly, then there should be no road fatalities. Oh. Um, but as part of that, you're not supposed to call things accidents, you're supposed to call them crashes because accidents right. make it seem like, oh, it's nobody's fault, whereas oftentimes they're Crashes, crashes either through the fault of the driver or mm -hmm. sometimes a pedestrian mm -hmm. is doing something crazy or um, or maybe it's the road design and we should have right. done it in a better way, so. That's correct. I uh, have nothing to do with the use of that word. I know. Only the <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that, so I'm gonna now change. So, yeah, so we should all, I think we're all programmed to call them accidents, but um, the PC word now Cyclists is Cyclists call them crashes. Yes, yeah. Especially exactly. in a race. Um, and are we also talking now about the monthly report or did you have anything that you wanted to say about January? Because I, I just had a couple questions. One was, um, I noticed that meter, the um, yes. meter violations were down. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. And I also just wanted to check in with you. We've had, you know, a couple big storms and wanted to see how the, um, the dispatch center um, was working and if there'd been any issues or if the transition has, um, how the transition is going. Great. Um, so with regard to parking and looking at January last year is when we transitioned back to three, there was a, basically it was a scheduling issue where we only had two that month. So I'm interested to see what happens in, I'll look in February, I think that should even out again. Um, with regard to dispatch, we fully transitioned so that our officers are not in the center. That's been for, I guess, about a month now or so. And it's been um, great communication, the, uh, very receptive to any issues that have uh, come up. Um, I will say with the storms and our incident last Tuesday, I have to go back and really delve into the, the kind of the weeds of it, but from a, my perspective, I have nothing but um, good. Little things that there, a lot of people are, are new and they're still learning and you expect these little things to happen now and again, but um, from their responsiveness, their professionalism, I, I have nothing but uh, good to say. Super, thank you. Any other questions for the chief? Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Um, you know, you don't have to, you really don't have to stay for the could. traffic resolution. <laughs> we talked about it enough. Yes, I think that we've grilled you enough tonight, yes. Um, okay, so now we'll move on to the 2018 municipal budget. And I just, before um, we get into the meat of it, I just wanted to thank our CFO, Sandy Webb, for her work this year and also um, our Citizens Finance Advisory Committee. I see several members in the audience, um, Scott and um, Maureen and Julie. So thank you for all of your work too in getting us to this point. And I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I'm gonna give in a quick overview of the current budget as proposed, and then we have an amendment. Uh, just to give you a quick over overview before we have the public hearing, uh, this year's expenditures have increased 2.9% or about $1.8 million. Our salary and wages are down $488,000. Operating expenses have increased 5% um, of that. Uh, $1.5 million is for um, capital expenditures that we've, uh, cash capital that we've placed in the budget um, and that are, <clears throat> that have, there will be, um, subsidized through $1.5 million in surplus. Um, and again, uh, this year, as proposed, the budget, give me one second, I just lost my page. Yeah. 
the budget will go up $41.86 on the average household or 1% one, um, 1 increase. Um, that's the budget that's currently um, before you. Um, we are also asking for an amendment uh, after review um, with the Citizens Finance Committee, as you know, as part of our process each year, we do a projection of our surplus. And as you know, we had $1.6 million in additional surplus this year. Um, to bring that surplus down, we were targeting to bring it down $1.7 million. Um, and that's why we um, added $1.5 million in the budget of ad using additional surplus. Um, when we did our surplus projection for the following year, um, what we found out is we really wanted to reduce our surplus by $1.7 million. Uh, that even with doing the $1.5 million, our surplus is projected not to go down $1.7 million, but only $700,000. Uh, as a result of that, in looking at our surplus position, uh, CFAC and staff is recommending an amendment to the budget that would add use of additional $1 million dollars in surplus. Uh, and what we would do there would be uh, $600,000. $26,000 would be placed into cash capital to, play, to pay for existing capital, and then $372,000 would be used uh, to pay against the, um, the amount to be raised, therefore bringing the increase down to zero. So that's what we're recommending um, as an amendment for this evening. I don't think you're going to get too much objection to that. It's great news. So thank you. All right. Are there any questions for Mark or comments or? Nope. All right. We need to have the public hearing. Oh, yes. I don't think there's a mic up there, though. So can I just ask process-wise, we... I'm afraid to speak. <laughs> uh, process-wise, do we have the public hearing, and then we vote on... We vote on the ordinance? The way it's listed here... You should have the shows. public hearing, then you're going to vote on the amendment. You can't vote on the ordinance until, because you have an amendment. So what you'll have okay. to do is you'll have public hearing. Public hearing, then we vote on the vote resolution. On the amendment, okay. And then the ordinance will be um, held, held over till, till the 9th. Got it. Or, no? That's because Oh, you're that's, talking about the other ordinance. That's for the establishing the cap yes. bank. Yeah. So we should I'm do that, and we have a public hearing on that. And then we have the public hearing on the budget, and then we have the resolution. Okay. So just so everyone's clear, we have an ordinance in front of us, which is 2018-6, ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank, NJSA 40A 4-45.14. And this is something that we do every year. Um, uh, it's just good practice, so, um, but I will open up the public hearing for this ordinance, if anybody would like to speak about the cap bank. Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing, and is there a motion to approve the ordinance? So, so second. Moved by Mr. Liverman and seconded by Ms. Crumiller. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Howard? Yes. Mr. Liverman? Yes. Ms. Crummiller? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. Okay, the ordinance passes unanimously. And next we come to the public hearing on the 2018 municipal budget. And I'd like to open the public hearing up for the budget. Is there anybody who'd like to speak? Ms. Terry? <laughs> Kip Cherry, 24 Dempsey Avenue. Uh, 
I have just a little bit of an overview to give you and then a couple of suggestions. Um, as you know, a large part of Princeton has recently been reassessed, including the Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood, Harris Road, Jefferson Road, and Moore Street. My own neighborhood was reassessed last year. So many people have already had a hefty tax increase way above last year's rate increase and are still coping with finding the funds for the additional expense. At the same time, as you know, the school board is looking at an operating increase this year and then a huge increase of what looks like approximately $1,000 annually for several years in operating and capital costs uh, for an average home of around $850,000. And then, of course, as you know, there's now a $10,000 cap uh, at the federal level on the deductibility of property taxes. So the squeeze is on, particularly for those of moderate and middle income in our community, for sure. A tax increase is on top of an increase in valuation, and that's a killer for those on incomes that are not going up. More than ever, I am concerned about maintaining the special mix of incomes, race, and ethnicity that has been so much a part of Princeton's identity for generations. For this year's municipal budget, I do commend the staff and the council for the personnel efficiencies gained by relocating the police dispatch and by reorganizing personnel support for Access Princeton and the Health Department. However, I am wondering, with these individuals removed from total salaries, how much, that is what percentage, salaries are increasing over salaries of last year for the same pool of people? So far, I haven't heard that. I think maybe you haven't voted on that yet. Do you know? I just want to point out that um, there's been an average increase in inflation or an average inflation rate from 2013 through 2017, that has been just 1.3% annually. Are you, I, are you asking across the board what the... Yeah, I know for the last several years, you've done 1.5% increase. Is that what you're doing? Do you want to answer that, Mark? Right. Okay. So... Uh, well, although I will say that there are some, uh, you know, quite a few of the employees are in a union, and so those are contractual obligations that we have right. that are already set. I understand that. I'm talking about those that are not. Um, so I just want to point out to you for your consideration that the average inflation rate from 2013 annually to through 2017 has been 1.3 percent, just so that's in your head. So I have some additional suggestions, and I think it sounds like you just handled one of them, which was to reduce the surplus. So is that one that I don't have to worry about anymore? Okay. Um, and then there's the one time $1.5 million capital repayment. Is that still in the budget? So I, I, my suggestion is that you reduce that. I just want to put that suggestion out there. And finally, I want to recommend something relief to uh, leaf and tree pickup. I'd like to recommend one last Christmas tree pickup and one last leaf pickup. On the leaf pickup, I think we should be recommending that people compost leaves on site as much as possible. And I know that there are some people doing that, but I think that they all need more encouragement, real encouragement. If people don't have room on their property, they can still take them out themselves to the leaf and brush center. And of course, I'm only suggesting that one leaf pickup be eliminated in one Christmas tree pickup. Uh, as everyone knows, the center is out on Princeton Pike and Lawrence and is open on Saturday mornings. Uh, I know that we have a new street sweeper, and I would suggest that if this cutback causes it to be used less, we could rent it out to a neighboring municipality for the excess time and make maybe a little bit of money. I also would recommend a new sign for the center that more prominently features Princeton's name as a collaborator with Lawrence Township. Our name is out there, but somehow when you go to go into the center, it doesn't really jump out at you that this is our place for leaves and branches. I think people would feel more comfortable going out there if the name Princeton was really, uh, really visible. Uh, for these two items, I am told that we can easily determine this, we can't easily determine the savings because they are not individually listed in the budget. 
but I would hope that Public Works would be able to produce some numbers on this. I should mention, too, that leaves and branches put out in the street for pickup are a hazard. And as you know, there was a principal of a school in a neighboring municipality who was killed about a year ago uh, because he was running and, run, and ran out around the uh, branches and leaves in the road, and a young lady in a vehicle um, hit him and killed him, unfortunately. Hi, Kip, sorry. I don't think that the timer was going, and so... I'm done. Like, oh, you are done. All right. Those are all good points. So, but I'm, I'm very yeah. serious about this because I think yeah. that we could do a lot more to save money in the leaf area with composting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But it's not going. I don't see anything happening here. Okay. Um, are th and, and, and I will say, I know that there's um, the Public Works Committee has struggled with that issue for um, as long as I've been an elected official, I have to say. Um, but I do feel like there's uh, a growing recognition that it is a luxury that we have. I don't even know if you want to call it a luxury, uh, but it's something that we do need to look at for our sustainability and um, to, um, to make our roads safer and more attractive, too. Um, and maybe we can do more. I know we pushed, and I'm not sure how much we've been pushing the last year or so to get people to do that, to compost on their own property. Um, all right, is, is there anybody else who'd like to speak as part of the public hearing? Okay, um, so I will close the public hearing and um, see if there's um, a motion to introduce the resolution um, uh, amending the budget. I would move the amendment. Okay been moved by Mr. Cohen Second. and seconded by Mr. Liverman. And is there any discussion on this? Thanks, Mark. I just would like to, just so it doesn't get lost, just thank the staff once again and yes. thank members of CFAC. Um, you know, I think our, our goal is always to have a um, no increase and, you know, we understand the pressures that taxpayers are under, um, but we do try to balance that every year with being responsible and making sure that we're not, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to put together a no increase budget that then you're paying for yeah, in works. subsequent years, right. and it, in the end, it doesn't really save you that much, um, but this is a responsible um, zero increase, and I do want to thank everybody who helped to make that possible. Um, all right, any other further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the um, resolution passes and there will be another public hearing on the budget, on the amended budget on April 9th, 2018. Um, and now we're going to move, I will, um, I did forget council reports, which I always seem to forget, um, but we'll, why don't we go through the rest of the um, budget items and then we'll come back to council reports and I think I need to put them actually on the agenda so I keep I, we'll stop forgetting them all right um, so Mayor, I, I must leave the dais for the introduction of 2018-7 uh, uh, bond ordinance which I believe is next right okay. although I I here? was going to have you stay for the discussion of everything but the library items I thought right I thought that's what you said at the agenda meeting. No? Yeah, we did go through the whole thing. Okay. But All right. The bond ordinance is not yet either. I mean, that's after the work session. Right. We amended the agenda, though. Oh, oh. We would have worked it first. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, we have um, the first ordinance, which is 2018-7, bond ordinance providing for various capital improvements in and by Princeton in the county of Mercer, New Jersey, appropriating $9,307,670, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of $8,842,286 bonds or notes of Princeton to finance part of the cost thereof. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. DeShield to walk us through the items. Yes. Uh, what are those hit the highlights of this ordinance? 
Um, this ordinance includes police, IT, recreation, library, health, engineering, and infrastructure. Um, the major components in this year's budget, of course, are the engineering, which are the road projects. Um, some of the major areas that we have in this year's budget is the municipal fueling, fueling station, uh, which is necessary to move the fueling station with the new development for the PFAR site. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are the purchase of the two properties on Clearview, which again is um, a part of the PFAR, PFAR's development. Uh, in addition to that, we have at the library $500,000 for the replacement of their HVAC and chiller system. Um, and then the other major tr uh, project is the um, a replacement of the radio system and upgrades for the radio system for the police department uh, to fix some f coverage areas, uh, problems that we have. Uh, any questions? No, Ms. Kermiller? Oh, I, well, I, I was hoping we could hear from um, the library about the, um, the HVAC and just a little, you know, tell us why it seems like the, rel the library's kind of new, and so do, you know, just if you could <laughs> tell us why you need that, that would be great. You want to come up here. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about this. First of all, um, this is probably the thing we would least like to have to do. We would so much rather put this money toward uh, things that are more public. I mean, I think most of us in town don't even realize. Hey, Brad, that, can you make sure you're talking oh, into the mic? Sorry. I think most of us don't even realize that the library has a fourth floor, and we just want the HVAC to work. We don't want to have to spend money on it. So I appreciate the concern about whether it's absolutely necessary. The system itself is about 15 years old, and over the last few years, it has demonstrated that it is unreliable. Uh, we're putting a lot of money into maintaining it and, uh, and keeping it working as well as it can, and unfortunately, as well as it can, is not all that good, even at its best. Uh, it is also uh, inefficient in terms of the, you know, the environmental impact. It, it's, it's, you know, it's 15 years old, and the technology has improved, and um, most salient, it's, it's really loud. And so people come to the library expecting the space to offer quiet spaces to work. And you hear it not just on the third floor, which is the youth services floor, but also on the second floor. And I mean, it's, it's not supposed to be that way. It's not like it was that way when, when the building was built, but it's, again, because of the age and the state of the, uh, the system itself. So we've been working with uh, Sustainable Princeton and with a statewide um, energy firm that's been brought in as a consultant uh, to run an audit. They have uh, been given all of the numbers and all of the specs on the system itself, and they have also come out and spent a day with us in late February, and they haven't yet produced the, the final report, but it's, it's clear that, that it needs to be replaced. It's just a question of how much of an upgrade we can actually anticipate. And uh, so we, we do expect to get the numbers very soon, uh, you know, based on the, um, the companies that we've worked with in the past in terms of maintaining the HVAC and the companies we would most likely expect to offer the most competitive bids in replacing it. That's how we came up with the number. So I, I hope that gives you some, some context, again, for, for why we're asking for this. Okay, that's helped. So our... have they given you assurances that the new system will be quiet? The reason I'm asking is because this system is also really noisy. And one of the things I was kind of saying was, what, the library's getting a new HVAC? We need a new HVAC, and we don't, we don't even have it because it's so noisy. But, um, I, and I'm not sure that, I, I was wondering if there's anything that can be done. It must be even worse in a library. Well, I, I can't speak to the HVAC for, for I mean, this building. Have they but, been, tell, have they I, been telling you that theirs is yeah. quieter? Because I thought that there was a correlation between efficiency and noise. I know that's because of the, there's something about that that the there are when it's cold, ratings. you know, when they push it through in a more efficient manner, it makes a louder noise. Yeah. So there are decibel ratings. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in conjunction with Sustainable Princeton and uh, TRC, which is the consultant that that's working with the statewide 
um, consortium, you know, we have worked with the municipality and also uh, with the schools to, to do an audit to see if there are efficiencies that we could pick up in terms of replacing multiple systems at the same time. I don't know the final results of that report. Again, I, I know what, what we've contributed and what we're, we've heard back so far. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, if there are additional efficiencies to be gained. I, and I, again, we just have to go on the basic decibel ratings um, for the, the original specs, what we're hearing now, and, and what we're seeing for systems that we could use to replace our existing system. Okay, I, I, I hope that it's one of those things that I notice when I'm in somewhere, so I, I do support a quiet um, prioritizing the decibel level. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the information. Sure. Anything? Actually, Sorry. I just quick question. Yeah, sure. How? Uh, what is the longevity of the a new system? How is it another fifteen years or? That's what we can anticipate. I mean, I don't know if, if we can, you know, find one where we would expect the, where the actual uh, manufacturer's ratings would be for better. But but I, I have, I ask the same question because I I'm sure none of us want me to come back in fifteen years and ask for uh, this to be replaced yet again. Um, but. What I'm hearing is it, that's not necessarily where we should expect to see uh, significant improvements. We should more expect improvements in terms of, again, decibel ratings, in terms of the efficiency and, and the environmental impact and the, and the cost to run and, and maintain the system, uh, not necessarily in significant longevity in, increases. I mean, 20 years would be great. Okay. Thanks. Great. I think the library has proven itself to be uh, place where we send people to when there's a major power outage other places in the community and during the summer it's really important to make sure that the air conditioning is working um, so it's um, it's not just for you and the books I feel like it is for the it is for the whole community and you guys have shown that over and over again where it's an important to make sure that we have a building that can serve as um, a cooling center too, because it ends up being de facto that during a lot of the summer. For yeah, people I mean, who don't I, have air conditioning. Yeah, I mean, and it is worth pointing out that June through August are our busiest months in terms of door count and circulation, even separate from heat waves. I mean, it's that people want to read at that time, and we do a lot of programming at that time, um, school, ch children are out of school, yeah. people want to take books on vacation. So uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we really need to work very, very effectively during the summer. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Brett or for Mark on other items on the capital list? Okay. Um, Thank you. Is there, yeah, thanks Brett. Is there a motion to introduce? So moved. moved by Ms. Howard. Second. And seconded by Mr. Liverman. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Howard. Yes. Mr. Liverman. Yes. Ms. Crum Miller. Yes. Ms. Fraga. Yes. And the ordinance has been introduced, and the public hearing for this ordinance will be on April 9th, 2018. And next is 2018-8, an ordinance appropriating $286,000 from sewer connection fees for various improvements in and by Princeton in the County of Mercer, New Jersey. And um, Mark, did you wanna say anything about sure, this ordinance? Sure, I'll just give a, a quick overview again. Um, these ordinance include uh, sewer system repairs. Um, in addition to that, it's for the purchase of two pickup trucks, which include plows um, for that, and that's the 286000 and that will be paid through sewer revenues. Okay. Are there any questions about the items on this list? No. Nope. Is there a motion to introduce? So moved. Moved by Ms. Crumiller. Second. And seconded by Mr. Quinn. Madam Clark, Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Howard. Yes. Mr. Liverman. Yes. Ms. Crumiller. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Ms. Fraga. Yes. And the public hearing for that ordinance will be on April 9th, 2018. Next, we come to 2018-9, bond ordinance providing for various improvements to the parking utility in and by Princeton in the County of Mercer, New Jersey, appropriating $1,583,000, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of $1,583,000 bonds or notes of the something is not quite grammatical here, bonds or notes of the to finance the cost thereof. I'm not quite sure what's missing there either. But anyways, um, 
uh, bonds or yeah, notes of Princeton to finance the cost thereof. Um, okay. Sorry for botching that. Um, <laughs> no Mark, problem. Did you have and again, a quick overview of this ordinance. This includes, this was paid through the uh, parking revenues and includes uh, two major items, one being um, the new installation of new meters um, and also the repair of the Spring Street garage. Um, we've done a structural review of the garage um, and every um, number of years where we go through the garage and make necessary repairs on structural items. Um, that's the majority of it. It's a million dollars for the, um, the meters and about $500,000 for the repairs to the garage. Yeah, um, what, do we usually use pickup trucks for parking enforcement? And it says pickup trucks, and then it's 34,000. It seems like that's not enough for more than one. I'm just curious when I- No, it's a, I'm not sure if it, does it say in the ordinance? I'm looking at a different sheet. Should be vehicles for parking enforcement. Okay, it says pickup trucks for parking enforcement on the, what I'm reading. That may be an error. Uh, it, it is. Yes, it should be parking enforcement. I just thought, uh, there's something I'm missing. Um, because, as I recall, we had some electric vehicles for parking enforcement, and they were having trouble. Has that, you might not know. I mean, I- I, I have to check with uh, Public Works. I mean, so I assume these are different parking enforcement, and they're not electric. It seems like it would probably say that in this. I don't know. I, I guess have to there's check. no way. Okay. Are there any other but questions? Should That's we right. make sure that it's not pickup trucks? I mean, no, do we need to not. care? Yeah, do, no. there, there isn't pickup trucks. I know, but do we need to change it or something? I know, yeah, it's so not, it's not, not on the yeah, record. We should make amendments yeah. to, these were for the, I just want to check with Sandy. Yeah. Vehicles, yeah. Okay. Can we just change that tonight, right now? I said, why not? I think, I think you can. Because that will be better if we introduce it the correct way. Okay, so you know, do you I, want to I propose I can move that? adoption with that change. Okay, I'll second three. that. Yeah. Okay, so it's been moved by Ms. Howard and seconded by Ms. Crummeler, um, changing pickup truck to vehicle in that section. And are, is there any other discussion before we vote on the introduction? All right, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Who first approved the? Oh, it was um, uh, Ms. Crummeler. It was, it was Howard to um, introduce and Crumler second. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Howard? Yes. Mr. Liverman? Yes. Ms. Crumler? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. So the ordinance is introduced and the public hearing will be on April 9th, 2018. Next is 2018-10 bond ordinance providing for sanitary sewer system and road reconstruction, road reconstruction projects in and by Princeton in the County of Mercer, New Jersey, appropriating $1,500,000, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of $1,500,000 bonds or notes of Princeton to finance the cost thereof. Um, again, I'll turn over to Mark if there's anything you wanted to say specifically about this. Uh, the only thing I'll say specifically about this, this is um, will be run through the Environmental uh, Trust Fund um, funding mechanism from the state. Okay. Um, are there any questions from councils or a motion to introduce? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Howard, seconded by Ms. Crumiller. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Howard? Yes. Mr. Liverman? Yes. Ms. Crumiller? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. And the public hearing for that ordinance will also be on April 9th, 2018. And um, thank you. Um, and now we will go back, um, and before we get to the council goals and priorities, um, I wanted to give my colleagues a chance to give their reports. So we'll start with Mr. Cohen, any reports? I just wanted to give a really brief uh, report from the public works meeting that we had, a uh, couple of things that I thought would be of interest. Um, one is that there's a proposal that was received by the Public Works Department to replace certain street lights with LED street lights, the ones that belong to Princeton, under a program where it would be amortized over the life of the fixtures, so there's no upfront cost. Um, so that was discussed at the meeting, and we're looking into that further. Um, 
And the other thing that I wanted to mention was um, that the uh, Public Works Department is looking at rearranging their um, service um, yard on John Street. And um, we're looking into opportunities to relocate the community garden that is adjacent to that. Um, and um, one of the ideas was to move it into the, there's a sort of a vacant lot that connects John Street to the um, Murray Stanworth development that seems to have some room for it. So we're reaching out to uh, the university to see if they might be willing to host that as a new location. Ms. Zimmer? Ms. Carmiller? Mr. Quinn? Just a, a brief report that uh, Councilwoman Fraga, Councilman, uh, Councilman Liverman and I have begun the review process of the first year of the Civil Rights Commission uh, that Council called for by resolution. Uh, we had a very productive work session this past Saturday and uh, we'll continue our interviews with current and former commissioners and administrators aiming to meet the May 1st deadline for a report back to council and we'll keep you advised if we for some reason are unable to meet that deadline. But I anticipate that we should be able to. I have a couple of items. Uh, starting with uh, the athletic fields, uh, because of the recent snowstorms, uh, the rec department's behind schedule on getting the fields uh, ready for spring sports. Uh, however, uh, the staff is uh, keeping an eye on the fields and they're in communication with uh, the volunteer sports groups so as to keep them updated uh, to let them know when they'll be ready for use. Um, Secondly, uh, on the pool, it's going to be, it's scheduled to be open on May 26th. Uh, also because of the weather, uh, they're behind schedule, normal schedule on preseason work. Uh, and, w but they are still planning to, uh, to open on time. However, what usually takes 12 weeks, they're going to need to get it done in eight, eight weeks in order to make that happen. So that's it. Great, thank you. Um, I have a few um, reports. The first one, I just wanted to ask um, a question of Trishka. Um, so I warned you about this one. So there was a news article um, that I think a bunch of us saw about Jersey City and how the mayor there instituted a moratorium on demolitions. And it's something that has been raised here as something that um, there was a lot of interest in pursuing that, but we were under the impression it wasn't legal. And if you could just speak to that, um, um, does Jersey City operate under a different set of rules than we do? Or um, Well, I want to look into it a little further in terms of exactly what uh, Jersey City is proposing. I did notice it's just a six-month moratorium while they put standards in place, so it's not you know, an outright prohibition on demolitions beyond that initial period. But I need to find out more about it because I, I was surprised to read that. Um, from the way the press release was worded, it sounds like may, may be fairly tailored, but it's something I want to look into further. Okay, yeah, thank you. That would be great. It's, it, it is something that I think was on the wish list of the Neighborhood Character Initiative Group because as we're making changes, it would be nice to freeze things in place. Um, in order to put ordinances, the desired ordinances in, um, instead of having people try to race the clock and tear down the buildings um, before the rules apply. Okay, let me see what I can come up okay, with. Okay, that would be great, thank you. Um, assuming that there's interest from the rest of council and yes, finding definitely. that out. Um, I talked about um, a meeting we had about Vision Zero. Um, uh, this. It's probably a better report to come from somebody on CFAC, but I know that CFAC um, is considering with their normal newsletter to potentially put in a small insert from the school district, um, given that the, um, the 
referendum is going to be such an important issue this year. And I personally thought it was fine as long as it was really clear that communication was coming from the school district, not from the municipality. And before we you know, move forward with it and say yes to them, just wanted to get council's sense of whether people thought that was an okay thing. I mean, assuming if it, if it bumps the mailing up to cost more because we're in the next stamp range, I think we'd ask the school district to pitch in, but just as a concept to have them use our mailing to help with their communications. So, you know, we, we talked about the, this at the CFAC meeting today, and after a long discussion, we, we weren't um, immediately, we, we had reservations about the idea, and I think that, what was the if plan I, exactly going if forward? I gotta, and I think one thing that uh, CFAC wanted to do was at least have a conversation to better understand what, um, what information that we were talking about. And I think that was going to be the next step okay. they, were, they were assuming. Okay. And I, I'll also just uh, comment that I think there was a consensus on CFAC that actually having a discussion of the referendum included was not a great idea that in fact, because that's quite different than operating, you know, our newsletter deals with operating expenses and, you know, sort of annual um, things and that it, see, and there was also a concern that if there were any advocacy included in the school district's enclosure, that we would be blurring the line of what we're permitted to do um, since we've had an opinion from Trishka that we're really barred from um, opining on um, whether the referendum is a good thing or not. So while we're looking, we're interested in exploring the possibility of doing a joint communication or at least sharing the mailing that it would, we were looking to tailor it more to the operating budget. Well, and we talked about perhaps doing it a year in the next mailing rather than the one just there were lots looking of, at the um, there, were, well, there, lots there, of there were a lot of and one of the uh, another um, subject that was a big subject was that we have a citizen finance committee we are so lucky and grateful to our citizens um, who are talented and professional and the um, school board does doesn't have the similar committee so it would be helpful and our committee would love to help the school board start their committee and provide whatever support we can and we can also um, help them with a mailing list if they wanted to do their own mailing. Okay well it sounds like you guys are <laughs> thoroughly discussing it so thank you for that. Um, and then my final report is um, there was a, um, a meeting earlier today that I attended with um, Ms. Fraga on, um, with the a subset essentially of the public art review committee and um, everybody knows we um, were successful in winning a Bloomberg, um, a Bloomberg grant. There's another uh, um, opportunity for winning some more Bloomberg philanthropies money and this one has to do with public art. Um, so the deadline is once again <laughs> coming up very quickly. <laughs> so we're trying to put something together but I would love if folks have ideas for this to reach out to either myself or to Leticia. And essentially what the challenge is, is to um, come up with a civic issue um, that um, you engage local artists around addressing that issue through art. And because it's Bloomberg, they like to be able to measure the impact of it so there needs to be um, an outcome, a specific outcome that you're trying to reach and then a way to try to measure how the art is having an impact on that outcome. So um, we were brainstorming about um, issues of equity, um, the um, you know, immigrant community, um, but it's still pretty nebulous. So um, if folks have ideas, please share. It's due April 19th. So, but I feel like I'm, I'm confident that in the last minute, the <laughs> focus is the mind and it's actually a really great fun project. It's a million dollars. 
Um, there's folks at the university who are really excited and interested in helping too, both in the measurement side and also in um, collaborating. So that is that. Um, are there any staff reports? Nope. Okay. Um, then we can move on to our work session, which is on um, the 2018 Council Goals and Priorities. Thank you, CFAC. Thank you yeah, guys thank you. Great. I want to say again. While well, the projector is coming up, um, just wanted to let council know uh, this evening we're going to take a look at. Um, two components. You have a number of lists of different goals and priorities that council determined. Um, what I'm going to concentrate on this evening before you is uh, council's 2018 goals for the boards and commissions and uh, the council committee goals. Um, there are also some additional goals, but I think we talked about those during the retreat. Um, if there's any, any questions, you can bring those up to me um, during this, but I'm just going to concentrate on those two areas for this presentation. Are there any questions while we're waiting for this to come up? Any questions on um, any other areas besides the um, boards and commissions or the committee or the council committee goals? The other issue as we walk through these goals, what I'm going to try to get from council this evening is one, are there any goals that we have missed? Um, are, any, are there any goals that we need to prioritize? Um, or are there any other issues that we need to discuss concerning some of the goals? And what I'm going to do is since it's taking a while for this to start. Um, well, I could, I mean, speaking of that, <laughs> um, I, I just want to, I think there was, I sent you two versions from the Sewer Operating Committee, and what I meant was that the first one should replace the second one, and I think that you included both of them, so okay. that's just a little. Uh, gotcha. Okay. But um, the Complete Streets Committee, I, I thought that we hadn't done. <laughs> done this and I now I've spoken to some of the members of the committee and the committee actually did come up with goals I thought we hadn't had a chance and so I guess it anyway I, I missed it so the complete streets committee I have a set of goals and I can okay. email them to you and and when it the time comes I can tell the council so what I'll, just, I'll go ahead and get started we're going to look first at the list that you have 2018 goals boards and commissions um, and on page one um, I'm just going to highlight a number of issues when it comes to the Shade Tree, I mean, Recreation Commission. Uh, there are three goals, Mary Moss Park, um, the Mercer Grant Program. Uh, there are related goals that staff has um, concerning that, so we should um, understand that staff is also working on those goals. I don't know if there's any other issues on page one that we should discuss. If not, moving on to page two. Well, I will say, I think for all of the boards and commissions, we should put something in there to make sure that they review their page on the website and look at the website for, um, you know, how they can use it to better communicate that the work that they're doing. So there's sections on it, sections on the website for um, reports, um, for announcements, for events, um, and to, um, you know, make sure that they each have a process in place to um, make sure they're getting the word out about the good work that they're doing. Okay. Right, and we also wanted them to provide a photo, um, and I forgot about the um, Public Transit Committee did take a photo, so I will get that. But if any, because I looked at the website and some, we have a lot of, um, we still need photo, better photos. On page two, uh, the areas I want to highlight are the uh, Bike Advisory Committee. Uh, one of the things that I, th I think we need to look at, and it's for a discussion with council, is really clarifying the roles of the boards and commissions. Um, under two of their proposals, they talk about working with um, either decision maker, either um, departments and decision makers, where it really should be advising the council. I just want to make sure there's clarity um, in terms of the roles that any of these, when our boards and commissions, should be providing advice to the council. 
Well, should if they should we then reword these? We should, but I wanted to just bring it to your attention. That's okay. the way they presented them, and we should come back to them, let them know, make sure they're clear that the roles are to advise okay. the council, not. The so is that just staff. so we're we've by t by saying that we're we're taking care of that issue? Yes. I mean, so whoever's on the bike. Yeah, I think. I mean, for this, um, I'm just trying to interpret what they meant by this. But you know, I think Deanna Stockton attends their meetings, and. I think it does make sense if they're going to identify the top three near term priorities in the bicycle master plan, that it would be helpful not to have a set of priorities from Deanna and then a set of priorities from the bike committee, that they work on their priorities um, with input from engineering department or the other way around. Okay. We have to, I'll figure out how to, yeah, I understand how to word it, but I understand your concern too. Right. This comes up. I mean, this is a problem sometimes when a committee, because if committees are going to go around allocating staff time, it could, it could be a problem because there's right. not enough staff time to do everything that. The point is what the committee should be doing is making, they can make a recommendation to council about what the priority should be or reviewing, making recommendations based on what either staff has recommended as a priorities and, and giving advice that way. And I think it's important that we make sure that people understand that what people tend to do is provide, say that the staff should be doing why. And it should be the other way around, either they're advising council or they're commenting on staff's priorities. It's really hard. I mean, it is really hard not to do that. So <laughs> I'm just saying that to my colleague, the new ones. Any questions on that page? Um, next page, page three. Um, again, just bring up clarifying some of the roles in terms of the um, Environmental Commission when we talk about the um, the stormwater ordinance. And again, we just need to reread that so make sure we're clear. Um, the one issue for the environmental, the other issue is the green building sustainable element of the master plan. Um, we need to consider the fact that we are, will be without a planner um, so that may be a resource issue that we will have this year. Um, we need to prioritize what actual planning um, resources we'll be able to use this year. Um, and then the next item is. Can I just make a recommendation for that? And if we put in the word draft and it's solely within the Environmental Commission, because that's my understanding that the commission is working on it and they can put together a draft and that actually might be a good use of time but while we don't have a planner and then. So, so Mayor, I would say that you're correct that they are working on a draft and um, I, I know that recently Mr. Cohen reviewed uh, the draft and I don't think there's an expectation that the, um, that the element will go through the process this year, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that we should discourage them from continuing to work on it. I I haven't seen it, and I don't know what Mr. Cohen's impressions are of what he reviewed. But uh, I think that they they view it as a longer process. Um, uh, the next item is um, from the Environmental Commission engaged the Prince University campus plan anticipation and construction projects. Um, and again, I just thought this was an item that I'm not sure if council wanted to discuss, but it, uh, it's a big issue and I'm not sure where any direction you wanted to provide uh, the Environmental Commission. Could I, could I ask a question? Just um, this is for clarification when you talk about the different roles, is there a difference between committees and commissions and boards in terms of um, what, you know, what their different roles are, because it seems, you know, with PEC, they're doing some stuff with staff that maybe they're entitled to do as a commission, or maybe they're not, I don't know. There, what you have to do is you have to look specifically at each, um, when it comes to commission, they have certain, they may have some duties and responsibility, and it's spelled out either in the ordinance or in statute. Where, mm -hmm. they're, where they will work those dual roles. Um, but they're very specific of what those areas are, and that's what we have to make sure that um, 
they're within those areas when they're working okay. with staff. But a committee is always purely advisory. Sure. Yes. I was just checking to make sure. Yes. So I, I think the point is well taken about the wording of, of this goal, and I think it was the commission's uh, plan to share best practices with these other groups as sort of uh, an educational rather than um, than a review of uh, so I I work with I work with the commission which meets Wednesday on rewording this okay. so that it's clear that they're not making recommendations of any kind it's more of an information sharing relationship that they'd like to establish with these other entities, especially the university. Any other more questions on page three? Just a general comment on, I'm on page four now. Um, the housing board, a lot of this is, is staff oriented. Just want you to know the staff has the same, some of the same objectives here. So just a comment. There was one I wanted to add to here. I don't see it, um, which was to look at the definition of rent um, to try to get ahead of that because there have been some issues with Avalon Bay in terms of what was included in an affordable um, unit and not, and that was something that came up. Um, I was at a conference with a couple members of the Affordable Housing Board, but it seemed like a good thing to do, especially if we're about to um, embark on a new wave of affordable housing. Yeah, um, yeah the mayor is exactly right. Um, so everyone qualifies at a, at a number that they can pay uh, when they, doing the kind of affordable housing uh, rent, rental. And when they find themselves in the position of some of these developments such as Avalon, there are additional costs that never came up. So for instance, parking is $125 a month. Um, if you had a pet, I don't know if you have a pet or not, but a pet is like another $100 a month. Um, some of the facility charges, $125 a month. And by the time you're done, you know, it's no longer affordable housing. It's, you know, you're paying, you know, this twelve, thirteen hundred dollar bill or whatever. So we, we need to have a better way of trying to uh, find out if these fees are going to, are they mandatory or not mandatory? And I think with Avalon, we weren't um, expecting them to, to be mandatory, but, but they were, everyone had to pay them. Yeah, but I think the recommendation would be for the housing board to put on their agenda, so that's something, to, it would be like defining rent, and I don't know if we have to adopt an ordinance or something, but that, what, what, things that are basic that we think need to be included. Next one on page five, really no comments here unless council has one. Moving on, page six, uh, the only thing that I would say that does not appear in these um, for historic preservation, uh, council does, did discuss at the retreat design standards um, for the historic district as a priority. And I'm, if well, that's still in, on the case, I, then we should add I do that. want to comment on that. Um, I think it's, so in my discussions with the committee, um, you know, regaining the certified local government status was perceived as the first priority because that would then qualify them to apply for, um, for funding to help support the development of the design guidelines for the historic district. Um, I think that it's something that they don't feel capable of generating from within the committee, that it requires a degree of expertise and, and effort that they can't do themselves. Um, I also think I have understood from some of the budget discussions that there was actually funding allocated for such a consultant in prior years, but I'm not sure exactly where that stands right now because I know in the budget preparation process, there was some discussion of whether that funding would be carried over. So it's a, it's a question mark whether um, we want to be trying to identify a consultant to help with that. And I, I know, Liz, you felt like 
you didn't feel like it really should require a consultant. So I guess that's another piece of the of the discussion that you felt like there was a, should be a simple way to just do a couple of sketches and come up with something. But um, this, is, this is for the certified local government status. No, no, no. This is for the uh, design guidelines for the historic district. Oh. It's not on the list. I said we should right. add that to the list because we had discussions. Yeah, I mean, I think there's different ways to do it. So one idea was to just um, pull together successful applications or successful um, instances through photos of windows and doors and building frontages and signs that the um, historic district uh, the historic commission thinks of as good examples of like we want things like this we don't want things like that um, but yeah I mean I think obviously if you have a consultant it's going to be done faster and probably look nicer um, but is there a quick and dirty way to do it right too if we don't have the money I mean, I can bring it back to the committee again, but I think the answer will be that they'll feel like it's not something that they can, they can generate. All right. So in that, that's, that's in that case, not, right? Yeah. In, in that case, I, I mean, I don't know if we want to get into it right now tonight, but it's. I think that it is something really important <laughs> to. It's a continued frustration we hear about local businesses. Um, uh, especially in the downtown area and so I think having something that would basically communication to an applicant that this is the kind of thing where if you bring in an application that looks like this or that meets these certain guidelines you're going to have an easier time as opposed to it people feeling like they don't know um, what to put together one thing I will say we um... I believe there is um, money available in this year's budget to do for a consultant. Um, I just want to verify, go back through the budget to make sure that that's available and I can report back to council. And I just have uh, one or two other comments. Um, in terms of regaining the state issued certified lo local government status, um, I wasn't seeing that in the list of staff priorities but it is something that elizabeth kim yes. uh is is involved in and is currently working on so um maybe it belongs on that list and um i'm not sure if this is an important comment but the the remark um alongside the belt design standard for king's highway um, that not being a council priority is, I'm not sure what the message is there. Um, it is something they've been working on for a long time and I think that they're actually, we had a presentation on it at the most recent meeting. Um, I think they're fairly close to handing it off to the state. And so I, I'm not sure if this is meant to oh, suggest you know what, actually, that they should stop working on that or. No, actually I, I made the mistake. Um, kind of weird. Actually I thought this was the architectural survey so ah. that's actually my error okay wrong project okay <laughs> and that's one where we took we did not fund this year and that's why the comment was there have we gotten to corner house yet because it sort of is interspersed on all these pages at least in my version yeah it was they were just they were dispersed so I could fit things on the page. Some of them I had to Okay. Work. Yeah, because I, I think it just, it, it's a little bit of one of these things is not like the other one in terms of how they did their goals. So I would actually make a comment back to Corner House that it's not, I think having like a list of 20 things is actually not what this exercise is supposed to be. I think we wanted two or three things and even if it's just two things that they're going to be working on this year that are different from what they normally do or that's above and beyond as opposed to all the things that they do. Um, you know, is there anything they're going to be doing differently this year? Because otherwise it just fills up the whole list and it just, it. Nothing becomes important. Nothing becomes right. important. It also feels like it's answering a different question than everybody else and it's not, it's hard for us to actually focus in on what's being worked on this year. You know, to follow to follow up on that, um, 
when I was looking at the corner house list and when I was looking at the annual report of the police and what the police, uh, some of their activities in community policing, it reminded me that um, Liz, you had told me about someone at the university who's, a, who's doing research on behavior change. And some of the things that both Corner House and the police do, like the anti-bullying and the going into the schools and alcohol prevention, they don't, there's no way to measure or know that they're the best people to be doing it or that they're, the, and that they're effective. I'm not saying that they're not, but I think there's some research in that area going on. Is that what you, do you yeah, want to talk about that? It was probably Betsy Pallack, who's a MacArthur Grant winner who literally oh, a genius right. grant oh right that's so right I don't, yeah yeah that's yeah that's right, right. So i read she about does, her she does research on i love her research topics are like bullying in middle schools and solving <coughs> issues of genocide um but she's had success in both and it's really how do you go in but i think that there there are lessons to be learned for the bullying more in our situation um but I, I agree with you, and I think one of the lessons learned, even at this point, we're not that far into the Bloomberg challenge, but you know, in things that we do, how do we take a step back and think about, are there different ways to do it? How can we measure outcomes? Um, well, and I mean, we're funding both, you know, these activities, the taxpayers are funding these activities, and we never really talk about whether they work or not, and or, we don't well, have a way to measure them. Well, I, I could, well, since I'm on the corner house board, I can, I can kind of say that's, okay. that that's, um, when you say measure them, so for instance, we have programs, uh, World of Works or the World of Youth, where we take kids or children from ninth grade that probably would never have gone to college, usually, and they end up in 12th grade, and we end up with 90%, 90, 95% of those youth going on to college. And then we end up with um, even the 95 to 80% graduated from college. And they wouldn't have had that chance if they didn't have the leadership uh, uh, chance that they were given at the courthouse or through the programs. So there are measurements that we can look at that way. Um, and we can take um, some of the kids from the middle school that are in some of the programs at courthouse, you know, do and see the direction that they have turned and the direction that they go. Uh, there was a young lady that was struggling about two years ago and uh, courthouse actually reached out to her and, and she's entering college this year with a with a full full scholarship so there's there's many ways that we can measure uh, the success um, the, re the reduction of alcohol and drug consumption of uh, youth under 18 years old within the leadership program at courthouse has has gone it's like you know it's gone down to a really small small amount of, of folks and so there there's ways that we can you know sit and look at some measurements but the programs do work you know, they work with, you know, almost 300 kids, you know, every month, and, you know, they, they touch it one way or another. So um, I think that it's a very good program. I wouldn't mind um, Cornell's working along with the uh, professor at the university. If she's willing to step in and, and assist, that will be, be excellent. Right. I, you know, I did not mean to cast doubt on the work <laughs> of Corner House, <laughs> but just the... You know, just when you're thinking about funding things and it, it's it's... I, I don't really know if there's much we can do about it. I just wanted to raise the issue because I think it's, it's, it's not as cut and dry as some of the other things that we do. No, no, no. It, it's I, I've, I've always said it's, it's easier to um, look at when you buy um, asphalt or if you buy a vehicle or if you buy tires or if you put LED lighting in the lights. You, you, you can see all that. But these are intangibles. And the, the point is that when you deal with uh, a youth, or we deal with um, areas of people that have um, addiction, it's always harder to try to uh, show why th those areas are where you should put, place your money. But um, I can tell you, if you didn't have a corner house or something agency dealing with this, we'll have a lot more issues and problems uh, in Princeton than we have now. Um, you'll, be a, you'll be surprised at how many folks uh, go there for help. Any other, any other questions on page six? Page seven, and again, I guess the same comment arises in terms of just the formatting, just to take those, the number of uh, issues down there for Quarter House. Page eight, 
Any questions there? Page nine. Um, that's what um, the, I think. There's another page that says basically the same thing about the sewer operating committee. Yes. But we also had one that we didn't. I, I forgot to um, convey, and that's just that we hope to create a document or, or a, a white paper that raises awareness about um, flush, putting fats down the drain. Just a public service announcement while we're doing this. That it's really bad for the sewer system and for the environment to put fats down the drain, and I think people don't know that. Mm -hmm. Any kind, like butter, oil. The, the um, commercial, there's a huge um, system in place to deal with commercial weight, you know, fats and waste, but not with residential. And page 10, I just had one question here with the Senior Resource Center assessing the, the uh, rental rates. Uh, and custodial costs, I'm assuming that's for the municipality or is it for the senior center? I wasn't clear. So this is something that came out of discussion where um, the way things currently work at the Suzanne Patterson Center is that all uh, users of the space, other than, I guess, the Senior Resource Center, pay rent to use the space. And the rent is received and used as part of the Senior Resource Center's operating budget. Um, there's some dissatisfaction. You know, the cleaning of the Suzanne Patterson Center is under the auspices of the general custodial arrangements. And um, Bob Huff has indicated that, you know, if they're responsible for cleaning up after the renters, that he feels like there should be some uh, compensation that comes back to the municipality for that. And so in discussions with the director, um, you know, she's certainly amenable to putting a surcharge on the rental rates, examining, and she's actually been in the process of looking at rental rates for other spaces, similar spaces in town, and, uh, you know, is considering adjusting their rental rates to budgetarily help uh, cover some of the cleaning costs for the Suzanne Patterson Center. And would we use those funds, that those funds would come to us or would reduce the funding going to them or how we'd figure out how to do it? Exactly. Yeah, although I, I don't, I mean, it seems a shame to raise the rates. I mean, well, uh, I think, I don't you know, know, what they've found in their research is that the re rental rates are very low compared to other similar facilities in town. That's right, but these are ta the taxpayers own these buildings, and so I think they should be cheaper. But, right, well, but we're private subsidizing, facilities. we're basically subsidizing vendors and people who hold events. No, making... it's only available to nonprofits. It's used by, well, but another issue is that it's used by a lot of non-Princeton residents. So it's available for rental to outside groups, and there's a question whether taxpayers should be subsidizing. Uh, In a lot of places, you can have double rates. There's a rate for when there's sponsored events versus people coming in to general rentals. Does that make sense? Next issue, so page 11, any more questions on page 11? I mean 10? So moving to, to page 11, the only comment I have here um, is just um, to keep in mind in terms of resources with the um, transition in the Human Services Department, um, there may be some. You know, we don't have page 11. Oh, I'm sorry. I updated it. I actually updated what? it. And if I had the projection, you would see that. And that's probably <laughs> my fault. Is that why? Yeah. Should I, I'll take responsibility for being the late. Sorry. But wait, I don't have one that says one it's, either. It's after, it's the one that has public works committee. It just follows 10. You can, yeah. we can share. In the, yeah, follows. I know, I don't have, do you have anything? No. There's actually, I actually added a number of um, human services and some other departments on here after you received your last copy. Oh. Unfortunately, the projector doesn't work. Hmm? Gotcha. Does it? Hmm. In 
and that's it for the any areas that I missed from boards or committees, commissions. Oh, can I quickly just read off the complete streets one? Sure. Um, uh, uh, so proposal for traffic calming, speed humps and tables, raised sidewalks and others. Um, use of automatic speed cameras, that means explore, looking at that and um, right now there's legislation about someone is sponsored to allow speed cameras um, in work zones, in school zones, or others. Improving safety for pedestrians, the conditions of the sidewalks, crosswalks, and lighting at critical intersections and others. Um, implementation of master plan circulation objectives and strategic and strategies as determined by council. And I'll write those down and share, and they'll be in the final, uh, in the next discussion. Okay, um, we'll move on to the council committee goals. It's the next page that we want to review for this evening. And really, I just want to get anyone's input in terms of the goals that are here on page one. Um, any concerns? I think these are most of these are straightforward. Page two. Uh, the first item under economic development, um, one of the issues that we'll have to deal with there is uh, a consultant um, to gather the data necessary to uh, give us the information concerning the retail and office um, data. Any other, any questions on that page? Uh, the other issue on that page is the uh, Veblen House. I actually did receive a draft agreement from the county. Um, so they are um, really close. We need to kind of just now talk with the, uh, the friends um, and, and finish that process. But I do see that coming available April uh, sometime. We can have some more discussion. And then the, um, the last page, let three. And again, the Bevelin House is the big one, and that will be coming up in April. Any questions? Anything missing? I do have the one council that would be added. It's a legal committee, and that's just continuing uh, our monthly and proactive engagement for uh, the legal bills. Okay, thank you, Mark. I this is a little overwhelming. Do we know why the projection's not working tonight? No, I, I, I just asked, have a there, new... there's like two things not working. There's a new new guy, but yeah. he said there's two things not, not coming on for some reason. Yeah. So I, I think part of it, he has a new person and he may not be familiar with the system. Okay. Because I did know that the IT committee was also missing from here. <laughs> 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 um, no, hopefully there's okay. more. But um, I'd recommend, I mean, this is just, there's just a lot here still, so... I might recommend um, maybe as council president, Jenny and then myself and you can meet and just try to hone this list down um, so that it's sort of like apples to apples with all these things and we can go back to if there's issues with different boards and commissions based on the conversation tonight and then we'll try to get a cleaned up list for the April 9th meeting. Sure. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, where are we? We're at resolutions. First resolution, 18-131, resolution authorizing a professional services agreement for planning and escrow services with Banish Associates Incorporated for an amount not to exceed $30,000 <laughs> for 2018. And um, as we all know, this is um, part of the um, part of the help we're going to need when um, Lee Solo um, retires. And um, this, um, this PSA is really for the planning and zoning plan review. So the payment is almost all entirely coming out of escrow. Um, and um, I had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Banish along with um, Mark and a couple of the members of the staff. And um, I think he's gonna be really good. He has a familiarity with Princeton. He works, his company works for a lot of um, uh, 
towns and cities around the state of New Jersey. So um, anyways, uh, is there a Excellent. motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Second. Quinn Second. and seconded by Mr. Liverman. Any discussion? Um, I will say the one thing just to, um, so council members know and that the public know, um, when we pay for planning services out of escrow, there's sort of two sets of rates. So when you have a municipal planner on staff, which we have now, um, the rates are actually much lower than when you're using a contractor. So um, the rates are going to be going up for people who are bringing plans before the Planning and Zoning Board, and it's just the nature of how it is. Um, Mr. Banish actually had one of the better rates of the people that we looked at. Um, but I do just, we probably are going to hear from people. So I just wanted to give everybody that warning. Um, all right, with that, um, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Resolution passes unanimously. Next is 18132, resolution authorizing the use of New Jersey State Contract A42261 to purchase equipment for a new municipal fueling station on Mount Lucas Road and to replace the existing fueling station at the proposed Princeton First Aid and Rescue Squad site in the amount of $141,957.58. Is there a motion to approve? I'll move it. Moved by Ms. Kremler. Second. And seconded by Mr. Quinn. Any discussion or questions? Um, Mr. Cohen? Just curious. I mean, the, the number associated with this is, I think, about a third of what we uh, allocated in the capital uh, budget for this project. Is the rest installation, or are there other pieces that are coming down the pike? Or I believe there'll be installation, uh, preparation of the area, and other components that will make up the whole project. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Was that an aye? Aye. Okay. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded multiple syllables. All right. 18133, resolution authorizing approval of recommendations on traffic speed reductions and appropriate traffic calming devices. And um, what a great idea. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we put it on the table first and then we'll turn it over to Ms. Kremler. But is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Quinn. Is there a second? Se Seconded by Ms. Kremler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, I won't, I think you all read it and it's not complicated, but I just wanted to um, let everyone know that the, it looks simple and it looks like it's not complicated and it's not, but it, it is a result of a, a long deliberative process and it, the plan really evolved, and you can. And one, there are three. I think maybe three issues. Um, the the first is that we would like to. The, everyone wants more traffic enforcement, and we had that discussion already about the traffic enforcement. Um, the second is that. The second is that we're going to make a plan for the traffic calming rather than what happened in the past when we allowed you know speed bumps and humps, and that was that the traffic committee um, just reacted to people coming to them and asking them for for these things and so we are um, delegating this to a committee and then to create a, more of a long-term plan to maximize the effectiveness of speed humps or what have you to um, lower speeds in general throughout the town and to really focus on being equitable and not just reacting to which neighborhoods are organized or have. Um, and so I, I think it's a really good plan. Um, one, two, three. Maybe it was only two thing, main things. Well, I, I just want to praise. I think it's also great that it's data driven. You know, it's sort of yes. really intended to identify places that need uh, traffic calming based on volumes of pedestrians or numbers of accidents that have been had in these locations. And so it really makes it, um, it, it gives us some ammunition uh, for making the decisions. I think that's great. Right, and that's not, you know, I, I think I should have reported this to the council too. We, we've gotten an, at least one new 
there's a new kind of um, one of those speed cameras that makes it easier for to download the data. And so now the police are really on board with recording the data, keeping general data. So like someone was saying before in the previous in the discussion with um, our chief, we will we will be able to tell. You know, we can right now we're keep, we're, we're planning on keeping getting all this data, keeping it, seeing how it works. And um, I think it's really great. And, and it, so we couldn't do it before. We couldn't have done it like this in the past. Um, and I also want to thank the members of the committee and um, especially Surinder Sharma. He really helped with this draft. And I, I mean, with drafting the resolution and the recommendations. I don't know if you want to say anything. Do you want to? No. No, okay. Okay. Now we Great. All right. I wanted to thank Ms. Kremler. This has been on the wish list and I think on the goals list for quite a while. And it's great to finally see it. And I know as part of Mary Moss Playground that there at one point, I don't know if it's still the plan is to put in a speed table or something on John Street. Is that still in the works? Well, I think it's a what happened. Temporary one. Well, I unfortunately I think what the engineers said was that there's there's a problem with the speed table because of the slope of the street, so they can't put that in. Um, and there might be, and um, one of the things that, one of the options that the um, emergency workers and also the engineering department are really saying uh, is a viable option for speed humps is these speed cushions because they're spaced such that the wheels can go through, the emergency wheels can go through, but, um, so I'm not, so they might still be planned for John Street, but I know that that's what we were planning and then it turned out that the, the slope of John Street is a problem. So it's possible that that's not gonna happen. Okay, but well hopefully really... you guys can bring that up at one of your next meetings, yeah. especially before the playground opens because it is, I just can see that as being an extremely desirable place to take your little kid. Yeah. And um, there, I think there's going to be more foot traffic there, more car traffic there, and more little kids. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I know I, that I, they are, we are moving, um, trying to um, improve visibility for the crosswalk by removing some of, or moving, I think, some of the parking and some of the, um, or one, at least moving the, um, the distance, the, you know, the, keeping the intersection clear. Right. Okay, good. All right, um, any further discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the resolution passes unanimously. And next we come to 18134, resolution authorizing the purchase of affordable unit 434 Brickhouse Road in the amount of $32,000. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Liverman. Second. Seconded by, um, Mr. Cohen, and any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, resolution passes unanimously, and next we come to the consent ag agenda, which contains items of a routine nature passed by single vote. Are there any items anybody would like removed from the consent agenda? Ma Are we supposed to remove one? Mayor, there's one that needs to be removed. Oh, I didn't see that. Which one? Thank you, yeah, we're going to be removing um, item 18139, which is number five here. Um, we're going to remove it and not take action on it. Um, so, so Mayor, I move adoption of the entire consent agenda except for number five. Okay. I'll second. second. And so it's been moved by Ms. Howard, seconded by Ms. Kremler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And um, now is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Why did we take that off? Did we? Oh.